The common view of science. Last time I introduced scientific exceptionalism. According to this remarkably popular idea, science is special among all ways of knowing and dealing with the world. I also briefly discussed Fy Robin's rejection of scientific exceptionalism. Fy Robin thinks that science is not special. If you are like me, your reaction to Fy Robin might have been incredulity. He has to be wrong, you might have thought. But if he is wrong, there must be a difference between science and other things, a difference that makes science special. What is that difference? What makes science special? Among philosophers, this question is known as the demarcation problem. The word demarcation implies drawing a line, as we would between two countries on a map. Imagine all human endeavors. Among those, there are things like religion, art, politics, sports, and science. To solve the demarcation problem, you need to draw a line in such a way that on the one side of the line, there will be science and only science, and on the other side, there will be everything else. Most people think that this is easy. The difference between science and other stuff is how science operates, the scientific method. So we should ask, what is the scientific method? And once we discover the answer to that question, then we will have found what makes science special. That would solve the demarcation problem. So let's ask, what is the scientific method? Of course, Fire Robin's answer would be, there is no such thing as the scientific method. However, let's assume that Fire Robin is wrong. The scientific method exists. Then what is it? Last time we looked at the school kids' answer to this question. Science works by following these six easy steps. But I said that these steps are way too vague to distinguish science from other things. So let's graduate from school kids to grown-ups. What would a random adult on the street say how science operates? They would probably say something to the effect that science is the practice of deriving knowledge from observation of facts. We will call this view the common view of science. To assess the common view, we need to first unpack it a bit. The common view of science might look simplistic on the surface, but it is a compound of two complex practices that call for analysis, derivation of knowledge and observation of facts. In other words, to make sense of the common view of science, we need to answer two questions. First, what are facts and how do we observe them? And second, how do you derive knowledge from observation of facts? In this lecture, I will focus my attention on analyzing the common view's answer to the first question. What are facts and how do we observe them? By the proponents of the common view, facts are said to have three properties. First, facts are given directly through the senses to careful, unprejudiced observers. Facts are also supposed to be prior to and independent of theories. Finally, facts should be able to provide a firm foundation for scientific knowledge, giving it a special authoritative status. Let's evaluate each one of these theses. Let's start with the claim that facts are given directly through the senses to careful, unprejudiced observers. The idea behind this thesis is that we know facts through our sensory faculties, which relay to us a perfect copy of the information in our environment. Here, the camera analogy comes handy because the easiest faculty to explain how this is supposed to work is vision. Human vision, according to this analogy, works just like an old-fashioned film camera. Light bounces off objects and enters the eye through an adjustable aperture, which is your iris, and gets focused on the retina into a clear image by the lens. If that image contains, let's say, an old-fashioned film camera, then there is an old-fashioned film camera in front of you. That's a fact which you now know. The camera analogy, however, is problematic. To put it bluntly, that's not how human vision works. Yes, the eye works more or less as described, 
but there is more to vision than what goes inside your eyeballs. Indeed, the image projected on the retina is ambiguous and requires interpretation. Consider this picture of a bottle, for instance. I hope we can all agree that on the bottle, there is an image of two people in an intimate pose. Are you sure, though? I asked my three-year-old son what he sees on this image, and this is what he said. I see fish. Excuse the scientifically illiterate man for not knowing that dolphins are mammals, not fish. But yeah, he saw something you didn't notice before, probably. He saw it because he is not only scientifically illiterate, but also sexually illiterate. Also, he is illiterate in general, but you get my point. The figure is ambiguous. What we see is informed by what we know and what we don't know. When you are a young adult, which is, is I presume, most of my audience, sexuality is something we are hyper aware of. So that's what you see. When you are a three-year-old, you think about toys, robots, and animals. So it looks like a bunch of fish. Here's another example, the famous blue and white dress. It is called the blue and white dress because about 60% of the population sees it as a blue dress with dark stripes, and about 40% sees it as a white dress with gold stripes. Scientists hypothesize that the difference might be due to neurological differences between individuals. Indeed, color perception isn't as universal as one might think. The way we divide up the color spectrum is obviously a cultural and linguistic matter. What is not as obvious is how much of a difference your native language makes in your ability to differentiate different shades of a color. In some languages, such as Russian and my own native Turkish, there are two commonly used primarily color terms for what you guys refer to as blue. These terms aren't synonymous. They refer to different shades of blue. As a result, native speakers of Russian and Turkish, on average, tend to be able to differentiate slightly different shades of blue significantly better than native speakers of only English. How we see, it turns out, not only depends on what we know or the biological differences between our brains, but also the language we absorbed as children. Yet another example. Here you see chest x-rays of three individuals. Do you see anything abnormal? Pause the video and look at them carefully if you are an aspiring radiologist. The one on the left is tuberculosis, a potentially lethal bacterial infection. The one on the right is healthy. The one on the bottom has stage 2 lung cancer. At least that's what I'm told by people who know how to read x-rays. But they all look about the same to me. Yes, there are slight differences in between, but I have no idea what they signify. And unless you have medical training, you probably have no idea either. Here's another cool one. Look at the squares marked as A and B. They're clearly different shades of gray, right? A is darker and B is lighter. But that's not true. They are exactly the same shade. Indeed, your brain sees them as different shades because it interprets the retinal image and corrects for errors. Here, square B appears to be under the shadow cast by the green cylinder. So your brain unconsciously reasons for them to create the same retinal stimulation, B must be actually a lighter shade of gray. I know at this point, this feels like beating a dead horse, but one more example. This is a photograph taken through a bubble chamber, an old-style particle accelerator. These chambers were filled with water vapor and injected with high-energy particles. When the particles collided with others, they underwent characteristic interactions. Again, a trained eye can tell you that over here on the left, there is a neutron decaying into a proton, an electron, and a neutrino, and on the right, a muon is colliding with whatever. My point here isn't to drown you in techno babble. My point is, for me, this is just a black circle with funny scratches in it. I don't see electrons and stuff. 
I just see scratches. So what we see isn't just what is reflected on the retina. The brain has to interpret the retinal image to see. And that interpretation varies based on experience, biology, and prior knowledge. That means facts are not given directly through the senses. There are mental processes that we aren't even aware of, which pick up the retinal image or the vibrations on the eardrum or the stimulation of the nerves on our skin and interpret that data. Sometimes, perhaps even often, two careful unprejudiced observers can look at the same thing and see different things. The first property attributed to facts turned out to be bogus. Let's move on. Are facts prior to and independent of theory? Much of what I have said so far is also relevant to this claim. Remember the x-ray, the bottle, the bubble chamber. Can you extract the relevant facts from each image without having the prior knowledge of medicine, sexuality, or particle physics? Of course not. Therefore, facts cannot come first. They cannot be learned independently of theory. And finally, there is a claim that facts can provide a firm foundation for scientific knowledge. Is that true? Especially after realizing that observers who are trying to be as objective as possible can still see different things, and what we see depends on what we believe, I'm not so sure anymore. This, of course, supports Fire Robin's skepticism about science. But don't worry, we won't give up on science so easily. We will keep looking for a satisfactory answer to the demarcation problem that can hopefully show that scientific knowledge has a firm foundation. Recap. The demarcation problem is a simple sounding question. What makes science special? What is the difference between science and other things? In this lecture, we looked at an answer to that question, the common view of science. Science is deriving knowledge from observation of facts. We observed that the common view is committed to three questionable theses about facts and observation. Facts are given directly through the senses to careful, unprejudiced observers. Facts are prior to and independent of theory. And facts can provide a firm foundation for scientific knowledge. You don't have to agree with me, of course, but in my opinion, neither of them held any water. Still, however, we are only halfway down because our entire attention has been on the observation of facts part of the common view. In the next lecture, we will turn our critical gaze on how scientific knowledge could be derived from facts. It should be fun. This brings me to the end of this lecture. Send me an email if you have any questions. Thank you for your patience, and I'll catch you next time.